everybody welcome to the cc webinar series of iit jodhpur so today we have uh, mr prajesh pillai and mr aradya chatterji from mercedes benz bangalore so they will be speaking about uh, intelligent occupant sensing in car interiors so over to you prajesh uh, and aradya thank you for joining us okay thank you everyone for taking the time coming out to listen to us on a friday evening um, i'll just quickly share my screen i and if one of you could confirm if you can see the slide set uh is visible bridges from my end okay yeah, it's visible Okay, hopefully my video can run with it. If not, all right. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so today, um, Aratri Kedai will give a short perspective on uh, the topic for occupant sensing in passenger vehicles. Uh, what we do at MBRDI, uh, what products we uh, develop, uh, the technology behind it. Aratri will talk about the technology behind it. and uh, we'll keep it more impromptu so if anyone wants to interrupt ask questions feel free to um and uh, let's then get started so how many of you all know this topic of occupant sensing uh so often let's say people are inside cars they doze on wheels um sometimes they're not attentive they're looking at their phone um all these are uh, safety hazards for us as uh, vehicle oems and manufacturers we do not want to expose our uh, customers to we want to keep cars driving as the safest uh, environment um and hence it's quite important for us to know what is happening inside the car uh also with this new change um towards autonomous driving earlier the car occupant could be a driver could be a passenger i mean as a driver you have to focus on driving uh, as a passenger you are inside um, was was the only scope of operation but as autonomous driving comes in uh, people have more time inside the car which means uh, distractions are higher uh, risks are higher someone uh, could potentially uh, disrupt the uh, the safe autonomous vehicle that's driving and for all this uh, one important uh, part for us is to know what's happening inside that's where um, occupant sensing starts uh, it doesn't have to be only occupant uh, another often mistake that we find is uh, people don't use the products the right way um, an example is uh, car seats are placed in the uh, in an incorrect manner uh, maybe i do not know has anyone seen this movie called blind side uh how many of you all know maybe that uh, let's say kids uh, shouldn't be strapped on with a seat belt unless they are on a booster seat um or that uh, let's say child seat has to be placed correctly um often people don't they neglect this um as a result many of our safety systems don't work the way they are intended to um uh, so this also becomes a a very interesting topic for us to know uh if things are right uh to keep the environment a much safer place uh so these are some of the let's say user scenarios that we have the third thing that we see is a very uh, drastic change towards how uh user interaction and experience with the car is going to be uh if you look at most of the cars that are there now in the uh, let's say regular customer segment uh, they all have very chunky buttons on it a bit more expensive cars have uh, touch pads um, touch as the interface uh, but still in most cases you have to provide an explicit uh, uh, let's say exp uh, explicit uh, interface to the customer to for him to enable a function uh, for example if you let's say want the um, air conditioning chilled a bit you have to go hit a button or touch a um, or sort touch button uh, to bring the temperature down but what we think is uh, could it be possible that uh, by knowing let's say subtle human expressions that um, your customer or the occupant inside the car 
is actually uh, feeling a bit warm uh, and then can the car be intelligent enough to bring down the temperature or knowing that it's um, uh, getting too cold can it increase the temperature so where we want to go ahead is to bring the user experience to the next level what we call as uh, touchless gesture control um, wherein we do not expect the user to give an explicit um, command to the car but the car is intelligent to understand what the um, occupant or the user needs and reacts accordingly uh, there's a small animation that you see here where uh, someone's trying to tap onto the light inside um, again uh, a most common uh, thing that happens inside a car when uh, you are in the dark is you try to go reach for the light and um, i'm pretty sure all of us have had this experience where we really don't know where the light button is is it a tap button is it a slider switch um, uh, and we struggle about it uh, what if there are cameras looking inside the car and they know what's happening what the user wants to do and the light comes on automatically uh, then the other picture that i have shows a very uh, classic case of uh, driver monitoring you want to know if the uh, person is attentive is looking onto the road um, all this uh, until now were very optional features um, that um, i mean car manufacturers brought in as innovation uh, but um, more and more the uh, focus on safety increases and uh, euro and cap now onwards i think from 2024 onwards expects uh, driver monitoring as a standard function to get a five star rating inside um, so for an oem like mercedes um, who makes the safest cars uh, for us, it's very important that we uh, develop uh, products that not only meet the standards, but are way better than those. I mean, later when you have slides, I have some links for you to lead uh, what is publicly available content around this. Uh, so this is what uh, my team does. We are a group of about 20 research engineers uh, who end up uh, developing um, computer vision, I mean, solutions to these computer vision tasks. Uh, look when cameras are looking inside uh, the car we started this about uh, this, this journey about five years back uh, as a concept and maybe i can walk you through some of our uh, let's say inventions uh, that are developed in-house um, maybe to start with the most recent one uh, the s-class our flagship car that was released uh, last year had uh, i think couple of features that was even advertised. I think I have it already open for you. So let me close this tab and maybe play this. I think this was our uh, new S-Class launch. And uh, is my video also visible or is it too laggy? A bit laggy from my end, but it's nice. visible, yeah. Visible, yeah. OK. So now maybe, I don't know if you guys could see, this person looked back. Um, so he looked back and there is a screen in the car um, the sunscreen and, and that came down automatically on its own right um, this was one feature that we have developed in our team um, so knowing that the user is looking behind he doesn't have to explicitly go hit a switch to bring down the the sun slide uh, it comes down automatically uh, then you will also see as i think uh, he drives out uh, he wants to open the sunroof it just comes in in a while and you just have to go uh, let's say have a very touchless swipe gesture and the sunroof opens there you go right so this was another uh, feature that we have developed inside the car uh, how have we done all this yes there are cameras looking inside uh, we solve this uh, main problem of human pose estimation that i think Aratrik will go into details in a while mm. this is how we could bring such innovation to our fans. So this was uh, our recent uh, success. Um, in fact, um, this year, when uh, Marcus Brownlee, I think a very popular uh, reviewer, blogger, ended up showcasing the five uh, top features that he found interesting in the new electric uh, EQS uh, electric car, and there is this video about it. Um, you will see one function that he talks about. Uh, the audio doesn't come through, right, from the YouTube? Hello? No, the audio, the is, audio is not. 
Yeah. Okay, I don't know how to kind of relay the audio back. But um, if you see what he tries to tell is um, typically people have to go uh, pick a button on which uh, rear view mirror you want to adjust, right? There is usually a button here. Uh, whereas in the EQS, you don't have to do that. Uh, you just have to look at the mirror, and that's what I'm, I'm going to translate what he's saying now. So he just looks at the mirror, and you can adjust the mirror. You don't have to pick which mirror you want to pick, the left one or the right one, right? Uh, you just look, and it changes. And um, all this happens, again, because of uh, cameras looking inside uh, that decides where the occupant is looking at. So moving on, I mean, a uh, couple of years back, uh, we were also quite privileged to be invited uh, to give the uh, future talk at uh, CES. Uh, what you see in this picture, um, there's, a there's a video you can see later where uh, the person to the extreme right is uh, our head of department. Uh, he kind of gave the, when he was part of the future talk, uh, talking about how uh, touchless gesture and occupancy thing is going to be the next big thing in um, the new cars that are going to come around. Uh, finally, about four or four years later, this was, um, I think, our first, uh, let's say, public demonstration of the product that we've developed uh, here in Bang from Bangalore. This was the Paris Motor Show where our uh, CEO went ahead to talk about uh, the features in the car. Again, I think the audio would have been better if I could relay it. But for some reason, it's not coming through. So this was the uh, the new GLE, uh, the, and there I'll move it a bit front. He talks about how. So this is um, our, our new MBUX UI, and uh, the icons react based upon where the person's uh, the human hand is. Uh, the menu changes only when you reach near to the screen. Uh, and the moment you go back, the entire menu still uh, gives to, let's say, let's say if you're using navigation, you really don't like a clutter of icons, right? Why do you need those icons when you're not going to use it? You're going to use it only when you bring your hands close to it. And this is also one of the features enabled uh, from the technology that we have developed. Uh, so all set, we do this all in Bangalore. One of the um, one of the few programs where end-to-end, um, -end, right from uh, curing this concept to data collection, curating it for algorithms, training the algorithms. In fact, even uh, quantizing those algorithms, putting it on an embedded device such that they run real time, and delivering this complete end-to-end. Um, software that does occupant sensing is uh, delivered from my team in Bangalore. Uh, that's obviously a much larger team. Um, so that said, uh, I can pause for a few questions about uh, maybe occupant sensing or the need for it in uh, the vehicles before I will hand over to Aratrik, who will go uh, a lot more uh, deep into tech on how do we do this or how do we solve this uh, problem of human pose estimation in the car. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. I hope I was audible. Yeah, please, you're audible. I'll start sharing my screen now. OK. Maybe a short pause if anyone has any questions, uh, or else we can take questions maybe at the end. Let me know if it's visible once. Uh... Is it uh, visible? Yes, I can see. It is. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. So, uh, Bijesh talked about the like the things uh, we do, what we do. Uh, I am going to uh, uh, at least I will try to give a small a brief intro about how we do it. Uh, the basic inspiration of what we do inside car is from basically human pose estimation or understanding humans, how humans behave inside the car, and uh, hence this topic. Uh, uh, so the generally, the human pose estimation uh, in 
uh, standard public literature is uh, defined as uh, kind of uh, human body joints uh, which are uh, connected to form a skeleton as you can see in the left image uh, th these joints are basically numbered and we ultimately connected by bones to uh, form a final skeleton uh, the same uh, the task uh, can be uh, divided as given an image uh, we have to uh, find the body joints uh, from the image and then build the final skeleton uh, uh, the this uh, like task has multiple applications in uh, maybe person tracking or human segmentation uh, right and many other uh, downstream tasks uh, but generally what i want to talk about is uh, as you can see in the left slide there's a one person there's one bar, a human standing and hence one skeleton in the right there can be a case where an image has uh, multiple uh, persons right uh, similar to our uh, use case where inside the car we can have multiple driver passengers sitting inside the car and this is obviously called a multi-person uh, human pose estimation problem and we will basically focus on this uh, problem uh, not the single person one but a more generic case of is it degree a more generic case of multi-person uh, human pose estimation hmm. yeah. Can you please mute yourself? No, I can't. Yeah, sorry, I had to. Uh, no issue. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has any, any questions, uh, you can pause and ask me. Okay, so moving on. Uh, uh, so uh, the multi person uh, human pose estimation, uh, what it basically, there are uh, two kinds of approaches uh, to solve this problem. So one is what we call as the top down approach. Uh, in the top-down approach, what we do is uh, like given an image, a person detector detects the persons from the image. So as you can see, if you see my mouse pointer, this is the input image. A person detector basically detects how many persons are there in the image, and then it tries to regress the body joints. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, problem is easier because uh, we can detect the person and the joints. This is a kind of a two-stage approach. Uh, it has a disadvantage. It has large uh, computation overhead and cannot be like implemented in uh, real time. It's difficult to implement uh, because of the obvious reason that uh, given an image, a person detector a model has to be integrated along with the body joint regressor model. And hence, this suffers from large uh, computation bottleneck. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, other side of the problem, we have what we call as the bottom up approach. Right, so bottom up approach does not have any uh, person detector involved. So, uh, in that sense, it has low computation overhead. Right, so given an image, what we uh, do is we regress all of the joints that is possible from the image. Right, and then let it decide key which joint belongs to which person. So, the general pipeline is given an image, we uh, detect all of the joints that, that is possible, and then try to group the joints. Uh, like which joints belongs to which person like in the in this figure maybe green joint belongs to this boy and the red to this girl we decided later stage in the using the uh, specific downstream maybe grouping algorithm right so these are uh, both the two kinds of uh, approaches which is uh, available in like normal uh, public literature for multi-person human pose estimation now uh, what I will talk about is a, a specific architecture uh, from where our uh, uh, pipeline is basically inspired from. Uh, uh, this is called a, a stacked hourglass architecture. And this paper was actually a breakthrough uh, in the field of human pose estimation, like the way traditionally it was uh, imagined the, to, to solve the problem and, and the way it is actually solved the problem. Uh, so the way it solves the problem is uh, given an input image let's consider this is an input image of a size maybe h cross w cross 3 right and given the body joints uh, a stacked hourglass uh, architecture is nothing but generally a unit kind of an architecture where you have a set of encoders and a set of decoders right and maybe some resnet uh, res blocks in uh, parallel and you stack the architectures one after the other that is generally known as a stacked hourglass architecture. And then what it does is it forms heat maps of the body joints. Uh, previously, what algorithms used to do, in, at least in public literature, was directly regress the uh, joint locations as annotated uh, 
uh, in the data sets. But what this uh, hourglass architecture introduced was instead of directly regressing the position of the joints, what if we try to regress a Gaussian heat map? Like there will be the point where the Gaussian has maximum amplitude. And uh, I mean, be beside the point, there will be a certain variance, which uh, again is uh, user uh, defined or can be also be trained. Uh, but this is the kind of the approach they take. So what they output is uh, the number of the joints you have that many number of heat maps. So suppose, for example, you have maybe 10 joints in the image annotated, the, uh, the algorithm will output 10 uh, different kind of the heat maps. And then you do uh, non-maximal suppression and combine the heat maps to form the final, get the final joint predictions, like the final exact joint locations, what you want. But uh, yeah, so at, and M cross N is actually the output shape. Uh, now this varies from literature to literature. Now I will only, uh, I focused on about this paper followed. The loss function, what they use, use is generally a standard uh, uh, MSE loss between the ground truth and the predicted heat maps. So the ground truth heat map can easily be generated from the given joint annotations by placing a Gaussian over each joint. Uh, and this is the uh, kind of uh, thing they follow. So the H cross W, which is the input image shape, is actually 256 by 256. So they resize the uh, input image to a shape, this shape. And the heat map shape is actually 64 by 64. So you actually kind of have to upscale, upscale the heat map to kind of map it to the input image shape. And number of joints, as I already mentioned, is the number of annotated joints. Uh, so this is the kind of way they train the architecture. Uh, is there any question uh, on the training pipeline till now? Okay, moving on. So uh, the data sets which I used are generally this MP2 and Flick data set. Uh, these guys also use the same data set to train the network. And uh, they, they report uh, at that time the uh, state of the art accuracy in uh, each uh, joint, like all over on average. And they also uh, mentioned the each and every uh, accuracy on the joints. So for Human pose estimation, what we have a different metric called the percentage of correct key points and a given threshold. Uh, so uh, so uh, for this uh, metric uh, table, what the threshold is 0.5, what it means is like uh, how many uh, key points are actually within 0.5 threshold of the ground truth. And that percentage is actually the number what you can uh, see in this table. And, and this is the uh, kind of architecture our architecture is inspired from, uh, right? Obviously, we do not use the same architecture. Uh, but yeah, so this is the inspiration uh, we take. Uh, I have also provided the uh, PyTorch code, uh, like if anyone is interested in uh, implementing this and uh, just see how it works, right? Uh, this is the kind of the code base and the paper link. Yeah. So moving on. So this is uh, one uh, kind of a, a domain we work on, like the human pose estimation. Uh, but there's also another domain I will talk about, which is the hand pose recognition. This, I mean, each and every module has uh, are used for different things inside the card, right? And hand pose recognition actually uses what I just mentioned, the uh, stacked hourglass architecture. Uh, to kind of solve a specific problem, which I will just talk about. The hand pose recognition problem is something uh, like, uh, as you can see, I, I, I have three uh, images if it's visible. So in the first image, I have uh, five uh, kind of fingers pointing out. Let's call it a five finger pose. Uh, this can be called a twisted finger pose. This is kind of a, maybe uh, I try to holding a cup, maybe a cup holder pose, right? So the kind of task is given an image, uh, can I say what is the hand pose type? This kind of boils down to uh, an image classification problem. Given an image, I'm going to say whether this is a cat or a dog. Similarly, I'm going to say whether this, what kind of a pose my hand represents currently given the image. Uh, the problem uh, definition is simple, but the kind of implementation is uh, still challenging. Uh, 
what we kind of do uh, i will tell you the pipeline uh, uh, shortly so the, what we do is uh, we have an input image same as we used to do in stacked hourglass networks uh, and we pass it through the stacked hourglass network to get some uh, joints in the image for simplicity i just used one joint in the image right and and let's assume the stacked hourglass uh, network is giving us uh, joints and since the stacked hourglass network will give us joints for each and every possible hand in the image, right? Uh, we will take each and every joint and crop uh, some uh, the space around the joint, and we will pass this uh, hand crop to the uh, to some architecture for the final kind of the hand pose classification. Uh, let's call the crop a P cross P uh, for the time being. And what we do is we pass it through a convolution and neural network architecture to finally classify the pose labels. Let's say we have n pose labels. So the CNN will give us output in the uh, form of n class labels. Uh, and the architecture is kind of inspired from uh, ResNet uh, backbone. So we have some residual blocks uh, and uh, like an AlexNet uh, uses some NN linear layers or something. We use uh, combine those things and and and, and generally uh, have make our uh, network. So, uh, uh, but generally it's in, inspired from uh, backbones like AlexNet, uh, VGG uh, backbones. Uh, this is the kind of architecture we uh, generally use for uh, the to recognize the hand pose, right? Uh, what I will next talk about is some of the challenges we face. So till now I talked about like how we intend to solve the problem, but there are obviously challenges while uh, deploying in a uh, real life situation, specifically in a car, which has very uh, low compute resources, right? And also the data sets uh, we use for training the models and everything. So first is the uh, kind of the annotation definition, which comes into picture. So generally, all of the uh, public literature, uh, whenever we train the model, uh, we enjoy the benefits uh, because the data sets are already annotated. Uh, but in our case, uh, the data sets uh, we have to collect and we have to annotate. We have to define uh, each and every, uh, like, for example, this problem, hand pose type, we have to define for each uh, image. Uh, we have to define key, what is what does the hand represent? Uh, for each and every hand present in the image. And we do it for uh, maybe 10 lakh or 20 lakh of the images. And this is kind of the annotation definition we do, also the occlusion definition. Now, occlusion, by occlusion, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, take this image. Uh, as you can see, let's consider that these are the joints uh, which are of interest to us. Uh, these are marked in green, and uh, as I can say that from this view, okay, I can see all of the this person's joints, right? But what about this joint, the red joint, which is actually on the other side of the person and is not visible to the camera? But this kind of occlusion definition is is actually coming up now in public literature, but it's not. There's no specific data set which actually explicitly handles occlusion. Uh, actually, we uh, internally define this uh, annotation also, like the occlusion definition uh, for each and every task we have, right, to train the uh, algorithms. Uh, another thing which uh, maybe I will, uh, I mean, I will stress a bit more is on the background noise, uh, obviously, like uh, the noise that uh, comes with the image uh, on, on that part. So uh, as I just mentioned in the hand pose recognition problem, I did not mention uh, what uh, what is a uh, like what what is the crop size I'm using. I'm, I just said it's a p cross p crop size, right? So uh, the obvious question is like what can be the optimal uh, crop size, right, to uh, crop uh, around this uh, particular object of interest or hand, right? Uh, this has uh, a specific, uh, the, I mean, this is uh, specifically useful because as you can see, like in the first image, if I crop the hand like this, right, the hand is actually maybe, uh, I can see the hand as much closer to the camera, uh, but it has much less background influence, right, uh, compared to the other hands, which are actually far away maybe from the camera and a lot of background uh, information is coming into picture. And this will uh, inherently 
hamper the model training when we try to train the model and and ask the model to recognize this hand it will get confused a lot because uh, maybe there are other uh, things which are coming into picture but if i ask the model to recognize this hand there are very little background info and maybe the model will be uh, able to uh, recognize the hand a bit better than these pictures here so uh, what the point is like when, whenever we are increasing the crop size a lot of uh, background information are coming in and this is what we call as uh, background noise right now the question being uh, like is there any optimal uh, way to solve this problem uh, like anything directly from the top of the head is what if we use hand detectors directly uh, in this uh, problem like we detect the hand and then uh, classify right but then again these hand detectors actually uh, in real life uh, problem will uh, real life scenarios uh, will have definitely a bottleneck when training the uh, pipeline right we have to annotate each and every hand box of uh, so many images we have that is obviously uh, kind of uh, time consuming right uh, and and that obviously uh, slows down the whole pipeline of uh, you know data collection annotation training the model uh, th this takes a lot of time uh, so although this is one of the uh, like the obvious way uh, to solve the problem using a hand detector this is not the uh, as i can say not the optimal way to solve the problem so what what can be done uh, so uh, what we do uh, uh, did in one of our uh, uh, work is like uh, there's also a different modality of the data we have so we have also a different uh, modality called the depth data so uh, as you can uh, understand that uh, uh, the depth data and the hand crop size basically will follow a kind of a uh, non-linear relationship which will decrease uh, as the hand crop size increases or as the depth decreases the hand crop size will increase why because when i'm closer to the camera my hand crop uh, the depth is actually less because i'm closer to the camera and hence my hand crop size what should have been uh, should be big and when i'm far away my hand is far away from the camera it should be very small and this is the uh, kind of intuition we used to uh, uh, actually get uh, a better uh, what i can call a better hand crop uh, so yes yeah, so we can exploit this uh, depth data we get uh, uh, and get the hand crop uh, under depending upon the depth statistics we have on different images right uh, uh, so we exploit this inverse relationship uh, between the depth and the hand crop size uh, next what we devise is kind of a dynamic hand crop by dynamic, I mean that uh, it's actually dependent upon the hand shape rather than uh, taking a crop of maybe P by P. I, 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 I use a different algorithm to uh, get, get the hand crop shape. So what we do is uh, uh, like given an input image, I, uh, the pipeline is the same stacked hourglass network. We pass it through that and get the different joints. Right. And then uh, what we do is uh, we we use a, a built a table uh, like lookup table, right? Uh, which says ki within uh, maybe this depth range A1 to B1, we have this crop size D1 cross D1, A2 to B2, a crop size D2 cross D2, and and, and things like that. Uh, now, how do we get these values? Is that we use the normal data to uh, uh, train a different algorithm, which can uh, tell us like uh, what is the uh, our crop size for a given depth. And uh, we keep this actually uh, discretized to uh, be, you know, low on latency, uh, memory, uh, things like that. So whatever uh, the depth is, we get that as like the depth of this joint and then crop the hand around that. So maybe if the depth of this red joint is within A1 to B1, I will crop uh, uh, crop size of D1 cross D1 around this hand, right? And then since uh, CNN uh, accepts a fixed size, uh, 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 kind of a crop we uh, rescale it to maybe p cross p and pass it through the same convolution and backbone to uh, recognize this uh, post levels uh, so now okay so we we, we solved uh, try to solve one of the problem like uh, without going uh, into a problem of latency 
right and 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 annotation problem we try to solve using a different data modality uh, like leveraging a different data modality to uh, get a better uh, uh, hand crop and this obviously boosted the uh, classification performance as expected uh, but maybe uh, there are a few questions uh, still remaining is is is, is this uh, solution still optimal right uh, the the answer is no uh, we have still have some uh, disadvantages of using depth data the main point being that depth data is actually noisy so whatever uh, benefits we enjoy from using rgb data uh, the depth data is actually very noisy so uh, the whatever algorithm you are using to leverage from the depth data the accuracy of that algorithm will actually be dependent upon the uh, how, uh, how much noise uh, signal to noise ratio of the depth uh, data you are actually using right and obviously depth data is difficult to collect because it's not easier a uh, data modality to get uh, but then again, uh, the prop, one of the main uh, drawback that can I already told is this approach is actually discretized. Uh, it's because uh, uh, we are saying that within this depth range, our crop will be this fixed size. Again, within the, this depth range, our crop, our crop will be this fixed size. So, but the ideal problem, the optimal solution would have been if for each depth we could have told key okay, what should be, what should be the crop size. But then again, that will be so heavy on memory, it will be a giant lookup table, uh, difficult to store in memory, all these problems will come into picture. Uh, but yeah, we, we do suffer uh, from these uh, problems, but still uh, there are uh, advantages, right? Because the, the, we have low memory, right? It can directly run in car, right? With and has a low memory footprint. And also the latency is less because we are using the same architecture to do the task. Uh, using a small lookup table instead of using sophisticated uh, solutions such as the hand detector problem, right? Uh, 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 I think Bridges uh, can talk a bit more on the uh, latency and memory part. Uh, and this is uh, my presentation uh, talk till now. If anyone has, has any questions, uh, I think they can go ahead. And Bridges, you can jump in if you want to add anything. Yeah, depending on the time, maybe we don't have a slide for it. Uh, I can talk about the, ch the challenge that typically when you take any research solution to a product, um, what kind of challenges we face and how do we address it is something I can talk about. But let's just pause and see if overall anyone has questions. Yeah, participants, you can uh, just unmute your, yourself and ask, or if you wish, you can also type in the chat. Please feel free to ask questions. Uh, so I want to ask a couple of questions. Yeah. Ratrik, uh, so I want to ask that the hand pose estimation, which uh, yeah. you have uh, like just now showed, uh, so I can that can we directly pass the hand so the hand poses to the CNN like instead of instead of going through an intermediate step of like recognizing the like of uh, uh, I mean of predicting the joints first and then like yeah and then passing it to the CNN um, yeah so the problem being uh, in an image there can be multiple hands right so I mean instead of directly. So the, the problem can be as same as that of what we do in uh, object recognition, right? In an image, if you have multiple objects, what you will first do is first localize the object and then recognize the object, right? So it's inherently a two-stage problem. Uh, did I get your question, right? Uh, so I was asking that uh, like if we can directly pass, like in order to estimate, in order to estimate the hand pose, yeah. can we directly pass it to the CNN? Uh, the hand, the uh, so the hand, hand image. But the hand image actually we are directly passing. But uh, if there are multiple hands, that is when we are using the hourglass architecture to uh, tell us where the hands are. Okay, all right, all right, sure, sure, sure. And Did also one more thing question? I want. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. I want to ask one more thing: that where is the camera, like? Uh, uh, where is the camera placed in the car? Like, uh, is it on the like ceiling or uh, or yeah. it's on the dashboard and facing towards the driver? 
Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, uh, Bridges, can you uh, maybe explain this a bit? Yeah, uh, so Ravi, uh, in the in the generation that is launched, it is mounted on the roof. And we can speak about only what is in the launched uh, cars. So you'll find a lot of videos on YouTube that uh, show where the camera is. Um, you can ping us, one of us later, we can actually point you to one of those videos also. Okay. And Rajesh, are you also doing uh, like a, so like so, I mean, some analytics on the fact that, uh, I mean, is the driver feeling drowsy or uh, I mean, like is the driver speaking on the phone like while driving? <laughs> I mean, is it possible to do from a like rooftop camera? Uh, yes and no. So there are certain benefits as well as limitations uh, with a rooftop uh, mount of the camera. Uh, is what I would want to add. Uh, let's say a very short answer. Uh, okay. In terms of your question about uh, whether do we do analytics? Yes, uh, we have to do a lot of analytics because our ultimate aim is to have a complete understanding of what is happening inside the car. How does the person want to interact with the car? What is his state of alertness, right? So all this information, yes, it's collected. We have analytics, but anonymized. I know probably a following question would come in from people. Isn't it violation of privacy? Uh, so um, I can take more questions on that, but a quick thing, yes, we do collect so, all the analytics. Okay, so one last question from my side is that, uh, like in, I mean, during dark, it is of course difficult to use the camera. So mm -hmm. are you also using the IMU module somewhere in order to estimate the driving behavior better? Or that is uh, not your goal? Uh, you no, that is not my goal. goal. So yeah, so maybe okay. I'll, I would rather uh, avoid the specific question of whether we use the IMU, but rather I can yes, tell yes. you how we handle the dark part. Yes, it's a... Um, it's a problem that we need to understand. So we do not work in a single modality of an RGB uh, only. We have uh, multimodal uh, images that we capture from our sensors that we call as our cameras. There is um, RGB, there is depth, there is IR. Um, and all this put together is where we, let's say, get a complete understanding of what is happening, okay. whether it's day or night, whether there is active illumination or passive illumination. All right, all right, thanks. I think from Shrinkala, there is a question. Maybe Aratrik, you would be the best person to take it. Oh, okay, oh, okay, it's, it's not popping up. I can, I can probably read out. So she's asking, I'm assuming she, uh, she's asking uh, if there are many joins in the annotations, then is there a particular <laughs> reason of recognition, recognizing them? Okay. Uh, yeah, so if there are uh, m multiple joints in the annotation, then I mean the recognition. Uh, are you talking about hand pose? The hand pose, right? I mean, if I'm getting the question correctly. Uh, what will be under hand pose? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean, definitely uh, the 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 recognition will be actually uh, for each uh, uh, joint that is in the annotation. Or uh, that is actually detected in the image, if that is what you mean. I th I think uh, the question was specifically: Is there an, a specific order to follow? In my understanding, there is no specific no, order to follow. No, you no, can no, tailor no. your experiments to do any yeah. particular joint first or last. Yeah, yeah. I think there was another question that says uh, the joint identification approach was for detecting gestures. But how you manage to detect eye movements, uh, like in the case of uh, ORBMs? Um, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, too specific for us to <laughs> divulge it. Um, but let's, let me just put up that we know where the head is orienting to. And uh, from that, we are also able to find, uh, let's say, gaze. Maybe a good way to find out more de uh, details about all this is come in turn with us. Uh, and uh, this would be a direct opportunity for you guys also to know things in detail. I mean, the, the question is still uh, unclear to me, but joint identification approach was for detecting gestures, but detect eye movements is something else. 
So I think I think the the question was about the video that I showed where uh, ah, okay, okay. Uh, Sorry. look at the rear view mirror and the uh, and change it without uh, okay, okay, having okay. to pick or decide which one to move. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question for both of you. Actually, um, this is a bit more subjective. This is regarding the deployment of the models. So mm -hmm. the models that you design, if we use deep learning techniques, we tend to know that models are heavy and it requires a lot of computing powers and mm -hmm. memory spaces. So uh, what, what is your typical way to deploy this model so that um, it becomes a useful solution? Okay. I mean, what are the typical consideration or yes. the typical, uh, I mean, as far as you can disclose, typical Yes, uh, I mean, we, solution. Yeah, probably I can I can talk about this. I think that was also the part that Aratrik said is like kind of left behind. We intended to talk, but we didn't keep a specific slide for this. So yes, I mean, to start with, um, your assumptions are very right. Um, the deep learning models are too large for embedded devices. Uh, I mean, consider the fact uh, further that uh, you have hardly uh, 10 or 20, I mean, less than 10 or 20 milliseconds to make a decision. Because uh, imagine you have to capture an image from the camera, run a deep learning model, make a decision, send it back to the actuation, right? So there is uh, one of our features where we control lights. Imagine you try to do a tap to enable the light and the light comes on after even one minute. The user experience is bad. So um, we have uh, multiple ways of addressing this. First is to reduce model size without affecting um, its accuracy. There are a uh, few techniques of model pruning, layer pruning that we do internally. Uh, the team is an expert at identifying what, uh, what really contributes, what doesn't contribute, and that is one approach. Then um, the second big change comes in where we uh, reduce the precision of computing. Typically on the NVIDIA GPU, when you run, it's a floating point 32 uh, computation. Uh, we've also found out through our experience research that we really don't need that, uh, uh, let's say, precision and resolution in compute, right? And you can go down from a floating point arithmetic to an integer arithmetic. That is the first big benefit. Then second, we can go down from an integer arithmetic at 32 bits or 16 bits, even as low as 8 bits. Uh, so that reduces the uh, compute uh, and the latency required to execute the model. Uh, finally, uh, depending upon the embedded device or the chip manufacturer whom we work with, we also do a lot of device level optimizations to uh, speed up the specific operators, or I would say the uh, sequence of operators uh, that we use in our um, neural network design, the network architecture. So a mix of all this helps us um, bring down the size and the latency uh, while deploying it onto an edge device. Thanks, thanks for that, sir. Uh, just one more maybe related question, if I can ask. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you mentioned about uh, reducing the precision of the computations, right? So mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering, because this is, I mean, these computations should be very sensitive. I mean, in terms of requirement of the precision, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, you cannot afford to make wrong decisions eventually, yes. right? Yes. So uh, uh, in your general observation, how much does reduction of those precision impact the overall conclusion that you make? Um, there is no uh, clear number. It depends upon the uh, problem that you are trying to solve and also the architecture of the network. Uh, but what you said is right, that uh, while when we while we reduce precision, there is loss in accuracy, which is something that you just cannot avoid, right? I mean, uh, and um, there are, again, a few techniques, uh, some that are data aware. What I mean by data aware is, you know a certain set of calibration data points, what kind of, uh, numeric ranges apply to your model, apply to the input images that come to your model that helps you quantize with minimum error. Uh, we also have uh, secondary techniques where we further fine tune or retrain with the quantization constraints in place. 
then what happens is the model starts learning with this limitation that it has to operate within a lower discrete levels right uh, of numbers that it can use in the computation so these are uh, usual methods if that answers your question I'm sure. yeah. yeah thank you We have few from the audience. I think Jayant is asking how much uh, vehicle telematics is effective in driver behavior analysis compared to your approach in CV. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, both of us are not experts at that to answer. Yeah. We do not take any vehicle telematics as inputs uh, for our algorithms. We purely use uh, camera images as the only input. Uh, I think this question is again on vehicle telematics, advancing the next generation vehicle. Yes, I think your idea is right, and I'm pretty sure every uh, automotive manufacturer uh, supplier is working on it. Vehicle telematics also give a lot of uh, information regarding uh, driver behavior. So, cruisiness as a feature is not uh, new to Mercedes Benz car, it's been there for uh, at least uh, that I am aware for the last 15 years. And uh, during the earlier days, it was purely done using telematic signals and uh, not using, uh, it, let's say, uh, cameras or images. I think there's one more coming in from Neil. It's, he's asking if a person is wearing dark sunglasses, how do we know if the person is sleeping or not by the eye movements? Yes, so, uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, situations where uh, we are unable to judge correctly. Uh, I think one of the examples that you gave is also valid. We try to make good guesstimates. Uh, at the same time, uh, also know the confidence in our signals. In such scenarios, the confidence of our predictions drop. And uh, we leave it then up to uh, the particular function to decide how should they react to it when the confidence of the signals drops. There's another one from Bhumika, how the annotation of data set is performed. Is that an automatic process? Uh, Arathak, do you want to take it? I've been kind of talking <laughs> throughout. Yeah, I mean, uh, the annotation obviously uh, is uh, done uh, uh, manually, right? For the data sets we have till now. Uh, automatic process, if you mean that we're using a separate model to annotate, uh, we generally do manual annotation, but yeah, I mean, that depends. Uh, that actually depends upon the automatic process generally comes in when the model performance is actually to a decent level to do the uh, uh, manual annotation. I mean, to reach the accuracy of the manual annotation. But we generally prefer uh, manual annotation instead of uh, kind of a model doing the annotation for us. And just to add, we all we do all this in-house and uh... I mean, Aratri can correct the number, but I think we have uh, nearly more than 2 million images of uh, occupants inside the car with the yeah. human body annotated, right, Aratri? Yeah. So that's uh, in our understanding, one of the largest uh, data sets. Uh, I mean, annotation of all possible types, actually, not the, uh, so at least the two types we, uh, which I already mentioned and other types also. I don't see any more. Are there more? Oh, there are more. Oh, there are more. A lot more questions, I believe, down. Uh, no, no, I right? that's it. no, no, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Oh. We may uh, wait for five more minutes, maybe uh, questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. In fact, doesn't have to be with respect to this talk. If uh, there is anything that you want to know, how let's say uh, research happens, how research is different from academia versus uh, institution, yeah. there's something also I can address. So any anything of interest to you with computer vision? 
uh, on the work happening in my group feel free to ask Yeah, somebody's asking question. Yes, uh, always. Uh, I mean, we love interns. Uh, so just uh, just ping Ratrik or me uh, on LinkedIn, or I probably I can leave our uh, phone number or email address at the end of the talk. So if you're passionate about computer vision, uh, then we are the best place, I think, to be in Bangalore. Maybe, I mean, I can ask, I mean, for Pallavi or Anshuman, do you have uh, kind of some long term collaborations that as a department you want you intend to do with industry wherein uh, let's say either the master's projects or maybe phd candidates can spend some considerable time with us in the industry let's say mutually benefiting each other we don't get a lot of time to chase uh, i mean research is moving at such a fast pace uh, on one side we have product focus um, and on the other side, we still want to be um, at the cutting edge of research, right? And here we feel that uh, academia can help us a lot. Yeah. May, may I go ahead, Mala? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So we uh, we are very interested in these industrial collaborations as an, uh, from the perspective of the institute and from the perspective of the department also, we are very interested in this kind of collaborations. And actually, we are interested to send our students for internship uh, possibilities as well, uh, depending on the need to meet certain criteria, the internship mm -hmm. opportunities in terms of the time um, mm -hmm. they can work for. So if that is met, we can definitely send our students for internship. And actually, we want that to happen. And okay. in terms of the longer term collaborations, in terms of the project, we are definitely very, very interested and very open to uh, okay. Maybe we'll take this uh, offline then. That and uh, probably uh, our three yeah, uh, I mean, probably uh, Arachik has told you that we had some initial uh, discussions regarding that also. Mm -hmm. We can take it offline as well. Um, mm -hmm. But to sum things up, we are uh, very interested in this and would actually okay. like to go ahead with these possibilities. In fact, our institute is taking special steps for uh, encouraging this kind of industrial collaborations. I think, yeah, good to know. Probably we'll continue that in the Let's say another sure. thread. I think there's no more questions from the participants. Uh, so we can uh, wrap up here. It was a wonderful talk and it was a wonderful discussion. It was so nice to have you on board. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting us. Bye. 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 Bye.